should call this planet ocean planet rather than planet Earth. 70% covered with water, average depth two miles. And, uh, you know, we need to understand this because that's where we live. It's been our ancestors' home. It's our home for the future. It's going to be homes for our children and our children's children. And uh, this is a little bit misleading. It's a snapshot. And yes, it took a lot of technology to get that snapshot. But it makes us think that because we can see it, we understand it. We don't understand it. Why? Because, again, most of it's unexplored. So if you want to understand something, if you want to take action, you better understand what you're doing. And then to understand, you've got to know, study to study, you've got to explore. You've got to know what's out there. About 95% of the oceans are still unexplored, 95, 96% unexplored, have no idea what's out there. We're getting better at it, but there's a long way to go. Can we roll that? So 7 million people, maybe 8 billion, I'm sorry, billion people living on that planet. You can't see us from space during the daytime. We're that small, like microbes, a virus on this planet. And at nighttime, though, you see the nighttime sweeping across the Earth. There we are in all of our glory, lights lighting up, electric lights, fires burning, uh, gas flares from oil exploration. Uh, and that's one great way to see us. But the microbes that we are, we've managed like an organism to make the planet sick. You know, almost like waging war on the animals in the sea. We catch them, we kill them without any kind of management. But also we're dumping nutri uh, nutrients, pesticides, all the kinds of stuff that we take uh, for granted that is good for us, very bad usually for what's in the ocean. Uh, I, I'm pretty optimistic, oddly enough, because we know things now that we never knew before. So we're at that beginning stage where we're exploring, we're beginning to understand, and now we can take action. The worry is that we can love this planet to death, and we've got to avoid that. It's very easy to react emotionally rather than on fact. Next, please. If you strip away the water, this is an old slide, but it's still an important slide. We still use this all the time. It's probably from the 60s, early 60s. Uh, that's the bottom of the sea. And uh, it's really, uh, it's not exactly accurate, but it's got a pretty good idea of what's out there. The bottom line is, no pun intended, it's not, the oceans aren't flat at the bottom, covered with mud. Uh, in fact, it's got the world's largest mountain range right here. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge, 50,000 miles long through all the world's oceans. It's constant volcanoes, 80% of the volcanoes and earthquakes on the planet are on top of that mountain range. We have rivers like the Gulf Stream, that's really, we call them currents, but they're actually rivers of heat that come up the coast in this case, up toward uh, England and uh, Ireland. And we also have rivers that are cold water, instead of the Gulf Stream warm, cold water that hug the bottom and head south back to the equator. It's like a con conveyor belt. And right here, there's a, some cold water that goes over a huge escarpment. It's the wa largest waterfall on the planet, five times higher than Angel Falls beneath the sea. We've got uh, thousands of these valleys that crisscross across the ocean, many, many times wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. So I studied for my PhD, and I can tell you, we've only looked at a few of those. Every time we go to the bottom of one of these things, because they're very deep, find all sorts of new life and things like that. Uh, and oddly enough, we also have lakes beneath the sea. Here in the Gulf of Mexico, we found some ponds, pools, and then lakes. And uh, once we knew about that, we looked over here in the Mediterranean, and we're finding them too. I'm going to show you snippets about that. And then one of the things people think about uh, quite a bit about the ocean is uh, shipwrecks and Titanic. I'll show you a little bit about that. Titanic's right there. It was on its way from Southampton to New York. Sank right about there. To go uh, explore uh, at the bottom of the sea, you have to have technology. Uh, too deep to snorkel, too deep to scuba dive. And one of the most romantic and dramatic ways to go is in a sub. That's the submarine from Woods Hole Oceanographic. And there's three people inside here right now asking the very important question, should I have gone to the bathroom one more time? <laughs> because it's, it's a long day in a tiny little capsule, probably about the size of the circle, actually smaller than the circle. And it's a, about a 10-hour day, and it's just the three of you alone, and you float down to the bottom through light blue, dark blue, deep blue, and then black for two hours in blackness. We thought nothing would live there until we turned the lights on and took a good look around. And that whole blanket of water is full of life from the top to the bottom. Animals like this, the jellies, I'm a geologist, so I can just say jellies. I know they've got specific names. Uh, that's the top of the mountain range. When we go to the top of that mountain range, because it's volcanic, hot water geysers coming out of the seafloor, 750 degrees Fahrenheit, that water is toxic. It would kill all of us in a heartbeat, but it's a lifeblood for animals like these. These are almost alien life forms. 
Uh, the rival, in a world where we said no life at all, we have communities of life like this that rival the tropical rainforest, living off chemical energy coming from inside the earth out, not from the sunlight down. So we have the sub, we also have robotics now that we use quite a bit. It doesn't replace being there. I was looking at things like this, fire beneath the sea, and this is one of those lakes. We're crossing a shoreline right now. And uh, right here is the edge of the lake, right here, the shoreline. There's a fish, there's some mist, we'll get a better view in a moment. Uh, and again, you can imagine being in the submarine. There's the other edges up inside here, uh, here. Uh, you can imagine being in the submarine for the first time looking down on this from the, from the windows of the sub and seeing another a lake shore and more water beneath you when you're in water with waves on it. Uh, so we, we're finding these, and again, they're mysterious to us. That water is incredibly toxic, yet it's the host for all these animals you see living on the shoreline. There's mussels, clams, and things like that, certain kinds of shrimp and worms. Biologists said right away, well, nothing can live in there. And we said, absolutely right, except all the animals that we see living inside there. <laughs> they don't know about that rule. Uh, next, please. Uh, just so you know that everything's not in the deep water, this is some of the work, and this is uh, one of the favorite TED Talks. Uh, it's the work of Roger Hanlon, who studies cephalopods, and it's shallow water. Uh, there's a famous uh, New York Yankee philosopher, Yogi Berra. He, he said, uh, you could observe a lot just by watching. Yogi was right. So we learned uh, to sit still sometimes, not go running from place to place, but sit still and see what happens. And that's basically what Roger's doing here. That's a barracuda. If you're an octopus, a cephalopod, octopus, squid, cuttlefish, things like that, Roger studies, but you've got to be pretty crafty to hide from something like this or, or from a morial. Uh, let it run, please. And we'll show you just how crafty octopuses can be, how talented they can be. One of the things they do is camouflage and hide, and they not only change their skin color, also the texture of their skin. And I'll give you a hint. In this picture you're about to see, there's some algae sitting there, white bottom, fairly white bottom, but there's a large octopus hiding. And here comes Roger. There he is. And you'll see what he does. That's his eye. I'm always careful not to put the laser pointer in his eye still. I don't know why. Uh, but when he realizes he's been seen, off he goes. And then he hides, tries to bluff his way out of it by making his eye spot big and stretching out. We're going to run that backwards slowly. And it's hard to believe that this animal on the right, smooth skin, large animal, light skin, can turn into this stuff on the left. And this is slowed down. But watch him change his skin texture and color. And again, it happens like that. So this is a place where an octopus can hide because there's stuff around. There's a big clump of algae. In other places, there may not be stuff like that, so octopuses have to adapt. Next, please. So here are some sand flats. And you're going to see one of my favorite octopuses. I love it. Little curious guy. Uh, oh, run that, please. And here we're within diver depth. And where is he? I think, oh, there he is, sitting right here. There he is. I uh, love it. He's studying, uh, you know, he's studying the scuba diver. The scuba diver's studying him. And he, when he wants to move, he looks like a coconut. So he hides, he curls six legs up, walks on two legs, and makes his uh, escape across the bottom. So a predator is not really sure, is that what I want to eat? But then he says, how am I going to hide? Aha, I see something. And off he goes with a mission in mind. Coconut shell, half of a shell. So he says, this is great. Grabs the shell in his arms. Not exactly the place he wants to be. So he picks up that shell in his, his arms and off he goes. <laughs> Just amazing. Tries to find the right spot. Then all of a sudden he sees another shell. And this octopus thinks that's perfect. Talk about using tools. So there's the other half of a shell. Grabs both ends of the shells and pulls them together to make his little place. And then, I, like it, I love this, he peeks over the top so he can see what's going on. You'll see in a moment. There you go. There he is. Uh, maybe not the right place again. He waits there to, to uh, attack some food as a predator. So he moves again. And this time he's got both shells that he's moving. Which is uh, not easy to do. There's a, there's a flounder. And uh, now he sees something to eat. Off he goes from his little shell. A crab. Zap. Gone. Back to his house. But that took a lot of effort to walk across the sand with carrying these two big shells for an octopus. So instead of always walking, sometimes if he wants to get someplace quickly, pulls the shells together. There he is again looking. He's got an idea. 
And one, two, three, here he goes. <laughs> this whole idea about using tools, you know, when, when I was growing up, we were told only humans use tools. That, not true anymore. Not, I mean, this is one great example of how an animal can use tools. Next, please. Uh, Titanic, you can roll that, please. Uh, Titanic, it's something I'm in the middle of now. Uh, is exploring Titanic and trying to understand what's out there and how do we treat it. 108 years old, uh, pretty much uh, rusting away. Rust never sleeps. And the rust on Titanic, those are the anchors on the bow. They're about that big each link, 350 pounds. That stuff you see dripping off Titanic is rust, but it's caused by microbes actually eating the hull. When you have a shipwreck, the body of flesh is gone quickly, bones dissolve, in this case, even the ship itself is being eaten by microbes. That's where the uh, steering wheel used to be. That's the uh, wheelhouse of the Titanic and all the plaques that people have left over the years. Uh, the captain's bathtub and the joke we always have is there's still water in it, uh, in his bathtub, <laughs> which is true, uh, plumbing for the... So some of these things, these, uh, you know, Titanic, uh, te- Titanic is an icon of the deep. So some of these things that we see, there's the boilers. We have to make a decision. Do we leave them there for time to let the ocean take those things? Or do we choose and pick certain ones, iconic artifacts, and bring them back for the public to enjoy? Hotly debated idea. Some people call it treasure hunting. Some people call it grave robbing. And for us, it's just an important way to keep the legacy of that ship and to honor the people that perished on board that ship alive. Next, please. Uh, Okay, the confession. I had a rough time in elementary school and in... uh, High school. Uh, little did I, you know, I always looked around and said, how are these kids, what are they writing down? I couldn't take notes, I couldn't read. Uh, I found out later on in life, not long ago, that I have ADD. I have two boys, both of my boys had it. That's why I decided to have myself tested. And then it made sense. Uh, because when I was younger, uh, I was told I always wanted to be a scientist. I was out every night with my telescope, and they said, no, you can't be a scientist. You don't have the aptitude, don't have the skill set. Uh, but I did read, of all the books I couldn't read, I read these two, Thor Heyerdahl's Contiki on the left, and then Sherlock Holmes, one about exploration, the other one about being detective. And in there was this thing about science, and I took that away in my head. Next, please. And uh, it wasn't until 1976, I was selling shoes, seven years selling shoes, and I came across this. And this is a National Geographic article. I was in my mid-20s. It shows an underwater mountain range with this little speck on this mountain range, that little speck is a submarine elven. And that threw a switch inside me. I said, that's what I want to do. And uh, two years later, made my first dive in elven, elven, got my bachelor's degree, got my master's degree, and through a lot of work, got a PhD degree. And I never forgot that. I mean, you know, it wasn't that I got smarter. It's just that I got focused. I got driven, and I wanted to do this, and nothing was going to stop me from doing this. So when I talk to kids today, or even you, you I mean, there's no race here. If you have an interest and focus, you can get things done. One of the, the, the formula I think I use is that you gotta find your passion. You hear that a lot these days. Uh, then follow your curiosity. And again, you have to sacrifice some stuff to do that. It's pretty easy in a lot of ways because you're doing what you wanna do. And then the most important thing is to be able to share your voyage of discovery with other people so they can appreciate you and maybe ignite them too. Thank you very much.